All right. Let's do this. Let's do it. So this is Votary Podcast episode four, and it's a very different vibe today. No Jono, no Mike. I'm in Jono's seat. Jed's in Jed's seat. Mike's seat is empty, and we have our first guest. That's right. And how appropriate to have a first guest, none other than Charbel Nation, mm-hmm. my good friend. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And you came up in our first podcast because we were talking about origin story and we were talking about how important a time, a season um, it was for me when I was about to shut the doors on Votary. And, um, and then we had sort of a, what now I call a f- sort of famous lunch hmm. where uh, you sort of told me your story of having gone through tough times in the recession and um, the power of your story, that energy sort of spread over to me. You asked me some interesting questions and you helped me to um, really see the value of, 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 you know, keeping going for one. Wow. But you did it, and I, I was explaining to these guys, you did it in an interesting way because I, I was saying to you, uh, I don't know what to do. I really kind of think I need to shut the doors. Uh, I need money right now. And, um, you know, we're way behind bills and this and that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to you reading my, my book because I actually wrote some about this in the well, book. You'll, you'll see. That's a nice surprise as uh, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of an important part of the book. But in that meeting, you took your time and you explained to me, um, uh, you know, your situation and you kind of dug into the details of your situation. You, you had enough empathy to really um, be able to relate and talk through some of the things that you knew I would connect with. And then you asked a really kind of important question. You said, you, you may not remember this, but um, you said, you know, what's the faster path to money? Is it to go get a job or is it to go sell, sell your services, uh, you know, whatever that takes, you know? Yes. And now you didn't say door to door, but yep. that's the first thing that came to my mind because I had never done that. Yep. You know, I'd never gotten to that level where I'd try to sell door to door. Because, but you said you kind of finished it by saying either way you're selling. Yes. Yeah, I remember that exactly. And um, and that connected with me. And um, and then you were so gracious. Pretty much by the end of that day, you had basically ordered a month's worth of services by inviting me to come to your um, office and, and work there at the office. And, and that, that breathed life oh. back into 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 the company and it was kind of a renewal for me um so i just want you to know how important that was wow. to me and to votary and um and so i just think it'd be really cool if our guests could get to know the man that is Charbel nasium mm-hmm. and uh maybe you can maybe you can start by by you know telling us about your early life and and then later on we'll kind of bookend it with the, the challenges of building business here in the U.S. But, uh, sure. yeah, tell us all about you. How did you grow up? Uh, so I was born in Lebanon, um, right on the uh, Israeli-Lebanese borders, uh, the contested area uh, of that country, um, right in the middle of civil war. Uh, did everything that I needed to do to be able to survive as a young man. Uh, youngest of seven, growing up in uh, in a home that is less than 450 square feet uh, with seven siblings. Uh, so that was interesting. No indoor plumbing, <laughs> just to add insult to injury. Uh, it, it kind of these early years will humble you. Um, so anything anything better than that is is an improvement. Um, but just the closeness and, and being close knit to your siblings and to your uh, neighbors and to your mom and dad uh, at that early age is uh, is a key instrument as far as how um, how dad was a role model for myself and for my for my friends and for um, for later on learning that he was a role model for other business owners in the area. Um, I would say I stand on his shoulder because. Um, of all the things that he's done in his early um, early years of basically um, mentoring and, and helping small business owners, it's his stories 
that were told to me um, around a fire, firewood stove in, in, in cold and dark nights in Lebanon that kind of inspire me to enjoy that, that type of uh, uh, connection with him. And not only that, but being mentored by him um, and seeing the, the, the qualities that um, he possessed of knowing um, what to say and what to do in certain contested situations between people. He's always been uh, a mediator and a person that approached situations from a logical point of view, but most importantly, from a loving point of view. He wanted the best of every single person that was sitting there mediating with him. He wanted to uh, walk away with a win-win situation at every single obstacle that he, he was, you know, entrusted with. Because, you know, in those, in those times, in those days, you don't see uh, a lot of people resorting to mediation or attorneys or, you know, things that we enjoy today and we see that this is common. Um, back then, that wasn't available. So it was somebody that both parties will trust, both parties will listen to, and both parties have the, the understanding that that person is going to have their best interests in mind. So it was his stories that propelled me and, and, and made me the man that I am today. And I am so humble with, with, with your testimony and your story of, of saying and putting it that way, um, of, of how can we play a role in each other's lives and you never know where somebody is and you never know what a statement or a word that you may say to somebody how can it take them one way or another and i just love that um, that it did it did work it did work with you and with, with your family and how um, how it transformed a generation um, of uh, entrepreneurs that want to get into this business now you could open the door for them the same way that that door was open for you and most of the time as a young man i didn't understand that about myself and I realized that my dad would invest in certain ventures that I came in with and wild ideas and, and visions and, and things that I would come with. And he would either invest or he would just encourage. And I didn't realize that until later on in life that the times that he invest in something, it was the, the best ideas. These were the ideas that he believed that were going to be a good idea. And the times that he just gave me advice, um, Later on, I found out that that was a crazy idea and it was never going to work, but he didn't want to discourage me from doing it. He wanted me to see the value of failure and to learn from that. And, and that took a lot of wisdom on his side instead of saying, son, you're crazy, don't do that. So when I look back on my life and I say I'm a professional failure, <laughs> I, I have become very proficient of learning from failure, not to mention and not to say or label myself as a failure. I look at every single situation that did not work as a lesson instead of me. And this is not something that um, deter me from trying, but it taught me what not to do. Certain things that I did and certain things that I didn't do. Talk to me a little bit about that and as it relates to the environment that you grew up in, in Lebanon. Because I, obviously I think our, our viewers, listeners, are like me and they have only seen, you know, they've only grown up in this and I've had the yes. privilege of yep. traveling the, a lot of the world and I, I feel like I've seen a lot, but it's, there's nothing like what you grow up in to right. set your um, expectations about the world. So t talk to me a little bit about that environment. Uh, so I, I didn't come here till I was 25 years old. So the first 25 years of my life was spent in Lebanon and that entire growing up from, you know, six and a half years old at my first early memories and uh, seeing that the country was just torn apart in, in, in war-ridden um, conflict, civil conflict, was not a pleasant thing. So you'd have to, you know, survival, it doesn't, you know, people say survival in here and maybe they were talking about maybe stacking up for 30, 60 days to be able to have enough food and water. But survival in Lebanon was not getting shot, not getting blown up in a roadside bomb or it just accidentally the wrong time, the wrong place, being somewhere where you shouldn't have been. Um, that was completely different from what we understand here as a survival. So when you 
when you grow up in that kind of a heightened environment, all your senses are completely different. You're wired differently. Your survival mechanism is differently. You see opportunities differently. You don't see the same opportunity presented to five different people as the same thing. It's because you're looking at things from a completely fresh point of view. So you, you see that in a lot of immigrants that come here and they embrace every single thing thrown at them. They don't look at, they don't look down at certain, any opportunity because they look at the opportunity, not what that opportunity look like. It's just, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for me to create, to be able to be inventive, an opportunity to prove myself. It's a challenge. You want to make people proud of you uh, back home, especially, you know, if you're cl close knit as far as family oriented. Uh, but growing up in Lebanon, you have to really survive in the sense of the word that, um, number one, you don't want to die. You're going to do everything you can to be able to survive. Number two, you have to be able to make a living. Um, making a living was limited. You grow up in a town of 2,500 people. Um, there is not many grocery stores, a couple stores. There is not many uh, contractors, it's just one or two. Uh, very limited environment, very limited things. And it's not like you could travel across the country and say, well, if you don't like it there and you want access to the city, you could go to the city. We were basically in an area that was called the security zone and traveling was limited. So not only that you were limited geographically, you were, you were limited also with the resources. You were limited with peace. You can't go and travel to the city, to Beirut or to anywhere else um, and be able to have the same opportunity that people that grew up in the city have. So you, you have to think of the resources, the limited resources that you have in the country and be able to make the best out of it. Um, so growing up, I started coming out with crazy ideas of making paper bags was my first invention. And I had no, no glue and I had no resources to paper. So I was recycling some, some paper and using flour and water as, as my glue. And that didn't go very well. Um, my second thing is I was selling raffle tickets as, as a nine-year-old to my friends. And I learned that lending uh, money to uh, seven and eight-year-old and nine-year-old kids was not a good business model. <laughs> and so that business went bankrupt at an early age. Um, and then I kept trying. I kept trying things. I started working in my grandfather's wood shop uh, after school. Um, and then later on in life, after you know, I, w I became a teenager into my high school years, I started working in the fields in Israel, uh, picking apples and picking fruit and and that's how I was able to make a uh, little money to be able to support myself. Um, later on, I decided to become a business owner, learning from all my previous mistakes. I started um, uh, an arcade, uh, arcade place where I loved you know, playing video games and I decided I wanna make a business out of it. Other kids would like it, so I renovated a hall that was vacant and, and dilapidated and made it into a successful business in six months. I was making the average, um, I was making about $3,000 a month and the average income was $300 a month for an adult, a full grown adult with a, with a good business degree or a good model. I was making more than doctors. I, would make, I was making more than engineers and I decided to open another one in the neighboring town. And then I purchased a restaurant that was nearby um, adjacent to the arcade place. And before you know it, at 21 years old, I was running three businesses simultaneously while I was being also a drug enforcement officer as my full-time job. So, you know, even though the resources were limited, um, that entrepreneurial spirit that was in you, was, it's just, just baked in. <laughs> it's quite, of just, part of the culture. Just yes. the way that you're, you're, you're wired and, and, um, and, and, and to, to boot, you're just the, like you said, the culture is you got to get after something to be able to survive one way or another the physical survival and then the financial survival. 100%. Why would you ever leave that? Hmm. In that that's, that's a great question. And in that, that has a lot to do with um, all the calamities and all the, uh, the heartaches that I went through as, as a six and a half, seven year old, um, right in the beginning of the civil war, um, going through that, uh, I lost my mother um, and my sister and my grandmother in a, in a freak accident. Um, a rocket landed in our house, and that left um, a major scar in my heart. Uh, so growing up, you know, when I say you really need to survive, it, that that image in my head was was so imprinted that um, you can't just 
you know, wipe it off. You can't walk it off. You can't just forget about it and just move on with life. That becomes imprinted in your mind and your heart. And everything that you do from that point on is to not end up like this. So when the opportunity presented itself, um, I had no doubt in my mind that, you know, leaving the country was the first thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to change the, uh, uh, the future of my future family. I wasn't married at the time. I was thinking about migrating. And I just wanted to be able to give my, uh, my, my kids, my future kids, the opportunity to live in a country where they can be themselves that they don't have to worry about being blown up into pieces just because they're in the wrong place in the wrong time. So when I left, there was really no hesitation in my mind that this is the right thing to do and I'm going to leave and I don't think I'll ever come back. What were your, your impressions and understandings of America at that time when you were in Lebanon? Like, how, what, what kind of information did you have and how did you view America? Uh, so <laughs> that's a funny... Uh, First, I, I've learned English from cartoons. So growing up on Tom and Jerry and Popeye and, you know, um, all the uh, Transformer movies and stuff like that, so that that's your first a window into what, what America looked like. Like, mm-hmm. this is from America. You see the American flag in one of these cartoons, and you're like, wow, that's cool. You know, that, that's life. And as a kid, that's, that's the first initial memory of myself. Uh, then you get into the... Uh, teenage years and you're listening to American music. So I, I, I took a liking to country music and, and, and that's, you know, my friends are just blasting whatever they're blasting for songs and I'm listening to country music in my car and American music. So that was kind of like the second step. And then the third step, um, my cousin used to work for the Christian Broadcasting Network, which was based in Lebanon, at, you know, one of, one of their stations. So my cousin works for them as their um, producer and and then you see the American, you know, vehicles traveling back and forth through our town. You see the, the American flag on them. Uh, so that's the early childhood memories. Then you see the videos in Hollywood and the films. You go to the movie theater. Um, these are the kind of early uh, indications or um, um, introduction to that there is something else out there. It's different from this. And I don't want this. I want that. And that's kind of, you know, the initial... Uh, the initial memories of, of there is another world out there because if you if you live in that country, how would you know there is another country? There isn't. Did you have um, was it was it was it a co- complex enough thought to think in America there w- there will be more opportunity? Like we have these limitations here, but these mm-hmm. those limitations won't be there, or is it not that? Com- complex. Is it, it? it never crossed my mind. It, it, it never came up that you would, you would hear stories that people migrated here in the early days and they all made it. They all became somebody. There was no stories ever besides maybe one of my uncle's stories that he came in in the early 1900 here and he disappeared. Besides him, I don't know of one single story that um, a person came in here and did not make it. So the so that that's exactly what I'm asking. So the the impression is that th- there's not just opportunity, but that it, it's like as long as you get after it, you're gonna be a success. As soon as you get out of there, it's gonna be a success. And and, and there was no doubt in anybody's minds. Some of my 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 friends, my childhood friends, some of them left to South Africa and made it. Some of them left to Bolivia and made it. Some of them left to Peru to Mexico to Sweden, to Norway, to Canada. The first thing that you do as a young man in Lebanon was to, can I get out? And if the answer is yes, then you made it. There was no doubt in anybody's mind that they're going to struggle, that they're going to have to work 10 times harder than anybody else in that country that they're going to migrate to. But there was no doubt in anybody's mind that if you if you don't work as hard as you could possibly can, and if you give it your best, that you're going to succeed no matter what. On that topic, it sounds like there was, you know, the there had to have been some fear of the unknown, but that was mm-hmm. overshadowed by the fear of staying or something like. I don't want to put those words in your mouth, but yeah, yeah. talk to me about fear and and the role that fear has. You know, your experience with fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
it, early on, um, that definitely crossed my mind, but it wasn't as much as um, the opportunity to fail was much greater there than it is or was here. So you, you look at the lesser of the two evil and you say, okay, so what's the worst thing going to happen to me in here that I was stuck in a dead end job or um, I will end up dead on some side of a street, right? So you, you weigh the options and then of course, whatever it takes, you're just going to come here. And that was the case for me because I wasn't trying to talk myself out of migrating. I was talking myself into migrating, number one. And two, I've convinced myself that it's going to be tough. The beginning, the, the first few years, I knew what to expect. I knew that it's going to be hard work. But honestly, I didn't realize um, how lonely it would be. That's, that's, that's the part that I did not um, account for. I did not realize how much family played a role in my life and being supported by your 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 friends your family that you grew up with your school your your memories the people that you knew uh uncles aunts everybody and you don't realize the the, the magnitude of that um until you're really separated from all of that and you come in here and here i am um first year in here in 1995 and just down to the basic stuff of like not not just looking at the um, the human relation aspect of that, but looking at the physical preparation that what you don't expect, what you don't expect when you migrate. I wish somebody came in and said, okay, Charbel, you, you, you're moving from the Mediterranean into the Northeast. Mm -hmm. For goodness sake, buy a jacket, <laughs> right? Yeah, nobody came in and said that. So I'm here with just basically sweatpants and a couple of heavy sweaters that I used to use in the gym. In 1995, we had like the biggest blizzard on the face of the earth. I've never seen snow like that. I didn't know you can't park on the right side with your 323 Mazda and you get up in the morning and there's five feet of snow and the car is gone. You know what I mean, it was towed. And you're like, what the heck? I, I thought I just left Lebanon so I don't lose my car and nobody steals it. What the heck happened? <laughs> and so making calls and realizing that it was towed because you park on the round side. And it, it, things like that that you don't think ever of, but they pile up. They pile up just like little uh, uh, flakes of snow. And you start thinking and doubting yourself. And you start thinking, what the heck did I just do? You know, it, I don't have anybody here and nobody's teaching me about these things. The weather is stinks that the, the car is gone. I'm working as a landscaper. It, it was just piles, 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 piles. And in and, and those first couple of years, man, it, it, I've doubted everything that um, I've had in my mind as far as coming in here. But then you start learning, you start adapting, you start understanding, you start making less mistakes you start making more preparation. You start connecting to people that would make your life just a little bit easier. And I started remembering, you know, what my dad did with some people that he worked with. He looked at every single problem and realized that there could be a solution for that. And for him, it was working with as many people as he could possibly can. And I've realized early on that any one of those people, whether it was on his left or his right that he mediated with, that he had amazing influence with. And I started connecting with people. And the first thing that I started doing connecting with people was in church. It was one person that helped me get some furniture. The other person took me w with him um, in his old Lincoln Continental car, drive me around um, all the, the, the auto body shop because that's what he knew. His influence was with the people that owned auto body shops because he used to be an auto body shop owner. So he used his influence in helping me get a job at an auto body shop in the early years just to get me by for that next three months. And after that three months, after I was fired from that job, now I needed to figure out what to do next. And I thought that was the worst thing ever happened to me. I've never been fired from a job. I was making tons of money in Lebanon. I had prestige, I had influence. And here I am being thrown out of a, an auto body, you know, a joint. And for, for a reason that nothing I had to, you know, I didn't earn that. He just couldn't afford paying my insurance. He let me go. I thought that was the worst thing ever. But because of that, I was able to get a job selling cars 
which to most people in here in the U.S., that, you know, that's looked down at. But to me, it was an opportunity. Here we go again with an opportunity. That opportunity introduced me to a couple of influential people in my life that taught me about financing. Um, so within six months, I was the finance manager in that dealership. Uh, within a year, I'm negotiating a big contract, and I was recruited by a mortgage company. From that place, I was able to buy my first house. From that first house, I was able to start my first business, um, flipping homes and fixing dilapidated properties. And you start meeting people and you start going really wide with your influence and as far as how you connect with people and who can come alongside of you and partner up with you. What was your, your, your dad's um, feeling about you, about you leaving Lebanon? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> that's a deep one. Um, if it's up to him, um, he wouldn't have let me go. Uh, but he knew it was the best thing for me. He knew and had the wisdom to make me promise him that when the day comes, when he asked me to come back, to not listen to him, to disobey him. He wanted me to leave. He knew that if I stayed there and with the environment that we grew up in, that I'll end up like one of my friends. He didn't want to lose me. He would rather uh, um, temporarily not see me until we meet again than having to lose me at a young age. He knew that I could do well in, in, in here and in anywhere I go because he taught me well, but it, 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 was, it was hard on him. And that call came about um, right around 2013 um, where I got a call from him. He, you know, he's never asked me to come back um, in all these years. We talk on the phone. I make sure that he knows I'm okay. After my first house, after my first baby, after my first car, real car, um, I made sure that he knows I'm okay. And then 2013 came about and he called me and um, I could hear him. Yeah, he's never was the guy that kind of, you know, bear hug you and tell you he love you. And here I, here I am listening to him tells me he misses me. He misses me. Like this is, he never said that. Um, and um, asked me right at that phone call, um, am I ever going to come back? And I started crying. I started crying on the other line. I didn't want to say anything on the phone. And, uh, and that, that conversation that we had uh, 18 years earlier came right to life where I knew that this is it for him. Um, he was 83 years old. And about two weeks later, after that phone call, he had a stroke. Um, in that stroke, he was in the hospital for two days and they ended up passing right after that. Um, I wasn't able to even go back there and, and be there. Uh, for the funeral, but I knew um, the time was, was there. He kind of warned me that that time will come, and when that time comes, that I need to be strong. And uh, I felt that this is what he wanted me to do. He wants me to just start a new generation, to start a new family in here, and be able to make it against all odds. And his, his words and his encouragement and everything he equipped me with is what carried me through the early years. Would it have been risky for you to return? Yes, yes, 100%. 100%. When I was um, a drug enforcement officer, I was not a drug enforcement officer for the Lebanese government. I was a drug enforcement officer for the Israeli government. Israel had occupied an area in, in Lebanon, which where I grew up, for more than 20 years. And most of those years were the years that I was growing up as a as a young teenager and, and on to my adulthood. Um, so when the opportunity came to make a living, like I was mentioning earlier, I'm working in the fields. I actually worked building um, part of the fence between Lebanon and Israel uh, as, as in construction. Uh, I did whatever I had to do to survive. And when the opportunity came for me to leave, I left from Tel Aviv. I didn't leave from Lebanon. So as far as the Lebanese government goes, I work for the enemy and I left the country from an enemy territory. So if I would have came back in there and had to enter through the, the proper ports through Beirut or anywhere else, I would be prosecuted as an infidel. And that, that's, an, that's something that I didn't want to do and put my, my family and now my younger kids in that kind of jeopardy. And, and I knew that my dad wouldn't want me to risk all of that. When you were learning um, 
I think you've told me in the past that when you when you came over, you didn't know much English. Yes. And that was part of the part of the issue, part of the struggle in the in the in the beginning. When you got that sales job, um, what was it like trying to put broken English? I mean, at that point, you probably had some. You were yes. a little bit better, but what was it like to try to 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 feel yourself on that growth curve of going from a fired auto body, you know, worker to to to, to helping close sales and learn finance, like? Talk to me about your your self awareness in that time. Yeah, so the, the stereotype. I'll tell you a, a little bit about that. Uh, so here I am, armed with a ninety nine dollar suit from Sears. The the suit came in like different color pants, different kind of jacket with the shirt and tie on one on one hanger. So I I knew I had I had to wear a shirt and tie. So I went and bought that. So just picture that in your head, and then pile it up on top of uh, a young man from Lebanon doesn't speak a lot of English and. Uh, and I've never done, I've never seen a brand new car in my life. Okay. So the, all of that, the knowledge wasn't there. The awareness of how people buy cars wasn't there. Um, that people finance cars. It wasn't like I grew up and said, oh my God, I want to be a car salesman. It wasn't that. It was, it was out of necessity. So I show up one day, I, I've done the training in the, uh, um, in the training rooms as far as here's what a new car look like and this is how it functions and these are the features and I'm like, oh, so I'm enjoying, you know, the, the, the whole process of that. But at lunchtime, they said, go down and introduce yourself to the manager, to the floor manager. And at that time, it was the Dodge dealership um, that they assigned me to. So I go in there and I introduce myself at lunchtime and they were like hustling and bustling. It was a busy day. Um, the floor manager was busy processing paperwork. So I introduced myself um, briefly to him and he kind of dismissed me and, and, and so I'm walking around and just looking at flyers and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, can I see this car? I'm like, me? And they said, yeah, you work here, right? I looked around and said, I guess so. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I went to the manager and I said, this person wants to see the car. How can I show them the car? And he said, the keys are right there on the rack. Go show it to them. So I did. I took him for a test drive and uh, they came back and they said they wanted to buy the car. I'm like, okay, let me try to figure this out. I, I didn't get that training. So I, I asked one of the guys over there, like, do you, how do I sell this car? And he said, you need to purchase and sell, fill it out. And when you fill it out, grab a check from them and give it to the uh, floor manager. So I went and he did exactly that. Uh, and then I came back to the floor manager, whatever broken English that I have. I said, I sold the car and, and Jeff told me to come to you so you could okay it. So he looked at me, <laughs> puzzled, like, who are you again? And so I introduced myself again. He said, you sold the car? I said, yeah. Um, he said, how much did you sell the car for? I said, whatever the sticker said. So he said, you sold the car for sticker price. I said, yeah. He said, congratulations, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was my first sale on the first day. They decided to scrap my training and, and said, you're on the floor and let's start training you hands on and that month, I was the top salesperson, go on to the second month. And then I realized that people don't need to be sold. I was telling them stories. I was telling them where I came from. I wasn't telling them anything about the car. I didn't know anything about the car. They would ask me something about the horsepower or how many cylinders this car have. And I'm flipping through the brochure that they're flipping through. Sometimes I <laughs> borrowed it from them to say, let me take a look at that brochure and I'll tell you. I really didn't have any, any skill as far as sales skill, but I was connecting with them on the level that they needed to be connected to. How many kids they have, what do they need? They need a big car or a small car. Why they're upgrading from the car that they have that I thought was the most beautiful car I've ever seen. But here they are, they're buying a new vehicle. And I started connecting with them on the level um, as, as just a friend, not as a salesperson. And I believe in my heart till this day that they received that. They received it. They knew that they're not being sold. They're being helped. They're being guided. And that's exactly what I did. I became a guide for them and not a salesperson. That's why some of the people that have the accountant that I sold my first car to is still one of our friends and in one of our connections. I send him a lot of people that want to do their, their books and their business. And those are the kind of relationship that you build over the years 
that end up turning into uh, a, an alliance instead of just, oh, this is somebody that I met 20 years ago and they bought something from me. Instead, this is another family that told me their story. Then now their story is part of my story. And this is how I build it. So you're um, in this growth phase. You're learning things. You're like a sponge. You're sucking all this information up. You're applying it. Um, what was it like? You, you talked a, b- a little bit about loneliness. Well, you know, during this time, even though you're sponging up that information, talk to me a little bit about oh, what was happening in your heart and in your mind regarding um, just the challenges, the psychological, emotional challenges that you faced. Yes, absolutely. So it was, um, I would say the first four or five years were probably the toughest. And during that time, I am married. Um, uh, within six months of being married, um, uh, we found out that we were, we're going to to have a child. And, uh, and a year later, that child came about. So now you're adding... Uh, another complexity to the situation, another soul that you have to be responsible for. Uh, so Jonathan was born uh, in 1996, and here I am still trying to figure it out and trying to put the pieces together and be responsible for a young, uh, young life. Um, my relationship with uh, my first wife was not the greatest, um, was not the most supportive person that I thought you know, I would be marrying. Um, so there was rocky ground at home. There was rocky ground um, in society. Still trying to understand how to navigate everything that the country is all about. Um, how to fit in in that um, large tapestry, what's called the United States. How can I be a functioning member of the society? How to treat credit? How to treat uh, borrowing? How to treat spending? How to treat... Um, the basic most of, of anything that you've ever done, like how do you establish your credit, all of these things that limit immigrants that, um, that, that migrated in here, um, that they didn't have those type of challenges back home. Because credit back home was you go to your uncle, to your aunt, to your friend, and you borrow some money, and then you pay it back with a handshake. Uh, you come in here and credit looks completely different. Uh, so you have to navigate that challenge without completely becoming um, frustrated with it, which I was in the beginning until I learned that. So that loneliness of n- being disconnected from family influence, um, coupled with the stress of being in a completely strange country, coupled with the stress that your personal relationship is is struggling because you didn't have a model of a mom and dad that, loved each other, you know, that, that was rob, you know, rob from me at a young, young age. So most of those kind of mistakes were part of my fault as well. I take responsibility for that. And part of it was ignorance and lack of knowledge and certain things that I was just not aware of as a young 25 year old married about to have a child and, and, um, trying to make it in a new country and all the, that pile of stress on you you start crumbling. So that's when my health uh, start also breaking down. Um, I lost tremendous amount of weight. I was working tremendous long hours. Um, I was close to 140 pounds and ill. I wasn't feeling well. Stress was getting to me. And uh, early on, um, uh, 2000, I think, so it's been here for five years, my health decided to just break down. And I was admitted to the ER and um, underwent an emergency surgery for um, for my gallbladder and and my doctor didn't know I'm going to make it. My kidneys were shutting down. My liver was struggling, and and they didn't understand why a young man would would have all these struggles, um, not knowing my background and not knowing the stress I'm going through and all of all of these things. And so something had to change that for all of that to change and. Um, get divorced that year and um, get over the, the, the health aspect of that and started connecting into um, a different family, a family that I didn't expect to be part of. That I thought with the divorce that that would eliminate my, my friendship uh, with my ex-wife, his brother, and her mother. 
Instead, they became more of a family to me after the divorce than it was before. And they became my, my emotional and, and, and family support. Um, learned how to um, navigate that route and be able to survive through uh, the toughest time of my life. And from there, I started making major changes. Uh, changes that till this day still carry me through any time that I, I encounter any issues in my life. Tell me, um, in a nutshell, what, what, what the high level, those kinds of changes, are they emotional changes, psychological changes, the physical changes? All the above, honestly. And it, it started with the physical first. You know, my health was really deteriorating. I was not, um, I was not um, nourishing myself properly. I wasn't eating the right food. I completely changed my diet coming in from Lebanon to here. So now you're like in a different country and you're on fast food all the time and nothing nutrition. And so I, I started changing that. Um, that's the first thing that changed. The second thing that changed, um, my, um, my ex-mother-in-law uh, started to um, you know, tell me about the spiritual aspect of my life and how to to really change my perspective on life and be able to have a relationship with my creator. Um, I started having better friendship relationships. I started taking care of myself physically better, going to the gym, um, eating better, working better hours, upgrading jobs, eliminating certain things in stress. So the, the answer is yes, it's, it was all, all the above. It was almost like a 360 degree um, transformation. And it took about two years. You know, it wasn't, you know, just flick of a switch and then you're on to a different life. It was a different time in my life and it took a lot of effort to do that. And it took a lot of love. You know, you have to have a reason to live. You have to have a reason to fight. And if you don't see that reason, it wouldn't pull you. If you don't see that goal, it wouldn't attract you. Uh, instead, it just you look at every single day as a chore. And I didn't want that. Uh, I came in here with hopes and dreams. And when I was disappointed, I was disappointed because these hopes and dreams were not being realized quickly enough for my liking. Uh, so it took an adjustment mentally uh, on my side to be able to adjust my expectation to the level of circumstances surround me. And as soon as I started doing that, things just started you know, getting better. Today, as of this recording, um, you're a successful businessman. You have multiple businesses. Um, one of your most successful businesses is in real estate development. Yes. Y you know, I know that you've bought and sold more than 100 houses. I don't know how many you've built, but I know it's a lot. Talk to me about that first house <laughs> that you bought. And where did that fall in this season of stress that you're just talking mm -hmm. about? Right dead center. It, two years after I came in here, I was so determined to um, to become an owner instead of a renter. Um, I didn't see the concept of investing um, into leasing or renting. I saw the concept of of making it as to own my first property, um, and I started working, you know, toward that right in the middle of a shaky uh, relationship, marriage relationship. Um, I was successful of accomplishing that first sale, but all the money and all the, the profit that came out of that went into the divorce settlement. So you can't, you can't imagine my disappointment when, when I first you know, saw that the first time. I've never seen $120,000 in my life, and uh, you, you, you signed over that check faster than you have made it. It took me a year to fix that property to be able to sell it, and realize that profit and then um, just like that it was gone um, and I was extremely disappointed I was really disappointed that I've invested a year of my life I was successful of turning my first flip but I was not successful of retaining the money from that um, and in the beginning that looked like a failure and I honestly thought that that was a huge failure till I realized that what I have just done is I've just created a system of purchasing properties in 1998. There was no YouTube, there was no Flip This House, there was no reality TV, uh, HGTV or any of that. Uh, what I've realized at that time is that I've took something that was dilapidated, a home that was occupied by squirrels, and I turned <laughs> it into a three tenant occupied property in less than a year 
and I took the value from four thousand dollars to one hundred and twenty thousand in less than a year. You say it was worth four thousand. Why? What makes you say it was worth four <laughs> thousand? <laughs> Because I bought it for four thousand five hundred dollars. Um, I was so green and so naive. I went to an auction, and at the auction, there was about twenty, thirty people there. Um, that was my idea of buying a property for less than it's worth is to dig into auctions, and that was my perceived path toward home ownership. That I will buy a property at that time and make it my own. So I show up at the auction, and the auctioneer um, was there, registered, gave you know, showed proof of deposit. Five thousand dollar check that I've been saving for six months to be able to qualify for the auction. Um, the auction starts. I start bidding, not knowing what the heck I was doing. I was the successful bidder, but I didn't realize now I have to pay sixteen thousand dollars in taxes. So I bid up to twenty twenty two thousand dollars, which I have no idea where I was going to come up with the twenty two thousand dollars. Not to mention the sixteen thousand in addition back taxes. So I. I humbled myself and came up to the front and said, "I don't have the money. I I didn't realize that I have to pay all that taxes." I was just raising my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I was just raising my hand. I get excited <laughs> and I started raising my hand. And the, the guy wasn't too happy with me, so he announced it right there on the on a bullhorn that the auction is going to be canceled and it's going to be postponed for thirty days from now. Thirty um, days later, I get a call. I answered the call, and somebody on the other line called me as Mr. Najim. Mr. Najim, you register for auction so and so on Orange Street in Worcester, and we would like to invite you to come to see if you could come back to the auction today. I'm like first, they call me Mister. <laughs> that means they forgot that I was the guy that screwed up the auction. <laughs> <laughs> and two, I would love to go and take a second jab at it. Now I know. Now I know what not to do. So I show up to the auction, and it was me, the auctioneer, and the tax collector's office. That was it. There was no 25 investor trying to bid against me. I was the only person there from a client perspective, and I started talking this lady、um, out of bidding against me because she wanted to bid the highest number for the city to retain their their tax liability.、Um, so I told her, number one, I confessed I, I was the guy that screwed up the auction last <laughs> last month, and that all I have was the five thousand bucks that I have in my hand, and I think she took pity on me. And looked down at me, and she said, "Bid over me, and you could have it." And the the bid at that time, when the auctioneer was still going, was four thousand bucks. So I bid forty five hundred bucks, and I'm looking at her like this, and she let it go, and I was the successful bidder at forty five hundred bucks. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're telling that story. It's inspiring.、Um, that that's. What you just did right there is what gets us out of bed every morning.、Mm. It, it, we tell stories, and we help other people tell stories. Talk to me a little bit about the the impact that you've seen through your life as it relates to story. I'm sure, I'm sure you look back on your stories、mm-hmm. and you see them for what they are, and I'm sure that you see them differently, you know, in different years or in different circumstances. But just talk to me a little bit about. Your perception of the power of story,、um, incredible. I mean, this this conversation today is the result of a story, true or false? True. My dad modeled that for me. My dad of having those fire chats and roasting chestnut on a wood stove in the cold Lebanese nights、um, was the highlight of my day. This is when I come in and I'm I'm playing with whatever toy I have built. You know, earlier in my grandfather's wood shop, and here's Dad telling me about his day while playing solitaire, and he's basically telling me about so and so. Here's what they have. His here's the problem they were facing. This is how he came up with a solution. This is how now they are better friends and better neighbors and better business partners together.、Um, it was his model of a storytelling that was more of、um, a peacemaker um, approach. Um, He was the unofficial judge of the town. Really, that's that's how he approached、uh, being a peacemaker and and bringing people together. That attracted me the most.、Um, so I relate to having、um, encounters with with other people as to how can I understand, sympathize, process, and come up with a solution for whatever problem that they're having. And this is how.、Um, 
I have been wired since I was a kid. It wasn't something that, oh, I'm going to trick this person into telling me their deepest secret. It wasn't like that. It was, it was the empathy. It was the grace that God has given me. It was the example of my failure. So when I'm telling somebody about failing in marriage, I'm using my own story and not trying to to probe into theirs. But if they see um, if they see solace into my story, if they could see the value of what I have struggled with and how could they learn from that and how can they use it in their life, whether in their personal life or in their business, how can they draw off of that? That's number one. Number two, I see the value of every single person. Every single person have talent, have value, have skills that no one else have on the face of the earth. And we all need each other. We all need each other in the sense that I can't be everything to everybody, but I could be one thing to somebody and why don't I play that role the best? So if I have resources and someone else need it, I see myself as the person that's going to provide that resource on that given day. If somebody else see the value in me as a coach or a mentor, then that's what I'm going to play on that day. I'm going to use my experience as a business owner to be able to encourage somebody that, dude, 2008 hit me like a brick wall. I thought I've arrived. I thought I'm over the, the you know, um, being poor. I had 30 homes at the time. And for no fault of my own, 2008 hit, and I lose all the equity that I have accumulated over these years in all these properties combined. And not to mention now I have two, two kids under two years old. And I have to be able to provide real food, real diapers, a real shelter, and real heat in the middle of the winter. There was no option about that. There was no, oh, I'll just push it over, you know, a couple months and everything's going to be okay. No, you have immediate needs. So I got humble very quick back in 2008. I was on the floor. I remember um, clearly to this day, I was on the floor uh, counting whatever quarters we have in the drawers. And, and on that day, that was the decision whether to go and get more diapers for the kids or get more food for the week. And you have to split it in, in, in two ways. There was no ifs or buts about it. So through the stories, through the experiences, the experiences become stories. And when the stories touch somebody's heart on a, on a specific level, now you can make an impact. Now you could encourage somebody through the, the, the issues that you've gone through. Now you could encourage somebody to just make it for one more day. Let's just, let just focus on that next day. How can we take it from here, whatever that situation that's going on, to make it for another week, another month, another year. Now, how could you bring somebody else with you that may be one month behind you or one year behind you, and now you could encourage them and be able to just give them some hope into, here's where I was today, and look, look at what God has blessed me with today. And that's the succession. That's, that's really the links that we have to connect, the dots. And what part do we play into that chain? What part do we do we play into that tapestry, into that beautiful mosaic that God just created you on this earth for this reason, for this day, and now you're just going to play that role to the best of your ability and never look back? It's pretty amazing that you told that spe- cited that specific story about the diapers and, this, and the change because when you listen to episode one, you'll hear that Jed told that exact story oh, wow. and what it meant for him and the very thing that you're talking about right now using your experiences and your stories to encourage and help and be a resource for people when they're struggling that whole thing came up in episode one and the mm. impact that it had on jed's life wow. and i think it's safe to say that were it not for that and your choice to live your life in that way we wouldn't be sitting here right now in this in this office and for this company talking about this right now. Yeah, that's right. Um, it was your choice to encourage Jed with your story in the way that you did that helped him continue on for one more day for a few more months and just keep going and get through that hard time, which were it not for that, we wouldn't be here now. Wow. Which is pretty amazing. Yeah, and a lot of people will say, oh, you know, we, I went through a tough time and it was this, this, and then they just blaze through to the next thing. But being able to say, well, I was sitting on the floor counting quarters and it was either by diapers 
or that those are the details of the story that connect mm. and you know when i came and sat down with you for lunch those years ago that's where i was at wow you know i had kids and we were sitting down on the floor in my case i'm playing with them passing the time wondering how i'm going to get food for them uh the quarters had already been spent wow um but that connected so so much that <clears throat> you know, I just got so much hope from hmm. you having come out of it um, that I could potentially come out of it. And, um, and, and then, of course, there was um, the, the very unexpected um, you purchasing services, which I didn't expect you to do when we went and sat down for lunch. You, you, um, um, you know, it was a big deal. Hmm. So... I think it would be important since we're talking about kids and, and counting quarters and all that, there was another person that went through that with you at that time. And, and we've told the audience a little bit about your loneliness and um, the, the divorce from your first marriage. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you came out of the loneliness out of that time period and, and what it, what it resulted in. Um, so that's, that's by God's grace. Let me start there. Um, but I, I did not know God. I wasn't a believer uh, at the time. And um, there, was a, there was a period of five years between my divorce and meeting um, my, my, my bride and my girlfriend right now. Um, and it was a time where um, I was really having a hissy fit. I think the, the, um, the height of that uh, rebellion, uh, I basically remember... Uh, having a fight with God. I was coming home from a late night um, party. And I, um, I remember how lonely I was after that party. You're right there. You, you, you're rubbing elbows with, with all the who's who's and having fun and spending money. And, and then the lights are off. And here I am going back to a lonely home by myself um, to enjoy all my success. And it was so empty. It was so empty. I didn't want to go there. And I remember on the way home, um, I was basically just banging on the, on, on the ceiling in my car. I was just like, why can't you just, I was talking to God. And I've never talked to God like that. And I was basically saying, why can't you just give me a woman that could love me and give me a family? That's all I want. I don't want all this. I don't want the parties. I don't want all of this people around me. I just want one person to love me and to be able to give me a family, the family that I dreamed about all my life, the family that I wanted to be able to just come back to in the end of the day after a hard working day. And a couple of weeks later from right that time, I got a call from a real estate agent and she was asking me, I was in Texas at the time helping a friend of mine buy a house. Uh, so I was in, in, in Massachusetts and she asked me about a property that I have for sale by owner. And if it's something that, um, if it's okay with me, if she could help me sell it. And, um, my, my heart jumped in my chest. Um, very weird. Just from her voice? From her voice. That's it. Um, I felt there was some connection in there, um, right over the phone. Um, I'm in Texas, she's in Massachusetts and, um, I told her I'll be back by Wednesday of next week. Maybe we could uh, touch base and then we'll talk. Um, and I came in here. First thing I did is I called, made the appointment, came in, met with her. And her office was right next to that intersection that was going through having a hissy fit in the car two weeks earlier. And we end up going, uh, after we met, uh, going right to the, um, to the corner um, there was a small restaurant in there and that was really officially our first date. And within a couple of hours, she was really interviewing me for the husband position. She was asking probing questions and it felt so weird. It felt so weird that um, there was that much attraction within like less than two hours. And then that loneliness set back in, uh, honest to God. During all that excitement, and all that time, uh, I felt that all the things that happened to me before disqualify me from enjoying this time. I was looking at myself, I was less. 
I was looking at her as something more. This is the dream woman of my life. And here I am talking my, my way out of it because I feel like whatever baggage that I have, it's going to mess up her life. I've never felt like that before where I, I would rather sacrifice a person uh, to save them. Um, I didn't want to you know, complicate her life. Um, but then it went on. A couple of weeks later, we were, were a little bit deeper in, into a friendship that turned into a relationship. A uh, couple months later, I, I basically, I couldn't hold it. I had to confess to her everything that happened uh, in my life and the things that would dis disqualify me from being the perfect husband, the perfect companion, the per perfect boyfriend to start. And uh, she didn't run. I was hoping that she would run. She did not. And um, I'm not sure if you ask her, sometimes she will say, maybe I should have run. But <laughs> I, think any, I think any wife or, or husband <laughs> would say that at different times. Yes, but thank God she didn't. Thank God she didn't. Right. And uh, she helped me build um, uh, the, uh, you know, a life together, uh, teaching our kids to love God and, and be the best they could be and, and to respect me and to love me and come love on me. And, um, and, and that's the kind of person that I prayed for. And that's what God gave me um, and gave me a second chance or a third or fourth chance. Um, if, if you ask some people that uh, he, he saw the good in me and he wanted to amplify that. And I'm so grateful for that. Hmm. You know, we have a tendency, uh, especially I think in the West with our stories and our storytelling to feel, to, 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 lean towards the happily ever after thing <laughs> yes. when in reality that's that's not that's not true like no. there, there are things that are uh that, that improve and we get better and of course there are there are holes in our heart that are filled and and are never mm. in, in the same desperate place as they were before yeah. but i know from firsthand experience uh, both in my marriage and my life and being your close friend for a number of years now that um there's there's always there's still challenges always. right always and you, you've come from Lebanon, you've built a business here, you're now sharing that with your wife, she's sharing her business with you, you guys are partners. Yes. And, um, and whatever ups and downs you have, you ride it together. Yeah. Um, and I know you'd have it no other way, I'd have it no other way. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you see in the future. And, and also, before you even go there, let me ask, having, um, you know, you're having gone through what you've gone through. When you enter conflict now, is there anything different? Do you do you feel differently about it? Do you look at it differently? Um, just talk to me about the difference between Charbel entering heavy conflict as a young man and now more middle aged. Yes, man. middle aged. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, and it's completely different. Like you mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, uh, is that um, thank God for wisdom as, as you and I get older and w we, have, we have experiences that we could draw off of. We have examples that we could draw off of. And for the few lucky ones that if they have a father or mother as a great role model example, they could draw off of that experience as well. So you're not just standing on your own merits, but you're standing on the shoulders of the people that came before you. Um, and that, that really helps. And for a certain time, I did not have that. Um, for the beginning younger years, I thought I knew it all. So I did not draw off of the wisdom of my dad as much as I should have. Um, and in my early 20s, I started drawing off of that, but it was, it was short lived when he passed, you know, uh, shortly after I came in here. Um, so that definitely played a role. And, and the role that it played when I was young, I decided to take matters in my own hand and be able to, uh, to look at what do I know, how much resources do I have, and how much horsepower do I have to solve X problem. Um, and now I look at it as uh, we've gone through that problem together. Hun, what do you think about this? Tell me what I'm missing because 99% of the time I'm missing something. Here are the facts. Here's, here's the problem. Here's where we're trying to get to. What do we do? Uh, versus I could take care of it all. Don't worry about it. I got this handled. Um, it's now not just in business, but it, it's it, business flows at home. 
we work together in the same office, but we still have to live in the same home. We share the same kids. We share the same life, and we need to be able to um, navigate that in a way where uh, it's not something that you could handle on your own. Um, now I look back at those, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? If we survived 2008 and all that calamity that came with it, how is this compared that we're going through compared to that? Or if we have um, an argument, God forbid that we ever have arguments, right? Uh -huh. um, how did we handle those conflicts and then these arguments before? And how can we navigate those today? How can we negotiate um, what's good for me, what's good for you, and come to a common ground? Are these corrections coming from a loving heart or are they coming from a spiteful heart? Are you saying this to hurt me or are you saying this to correct me? Uh, instead of just being reactive, to start being proactive about certain things that uh, we need to do. And, and God knows that we're not there. This is a process that every single day we go through and we grow together. And there are a lot of things that I am changing in my life still to this day. Uh, certain things that... Um, certain books that we we've read you know you read a lot you understand we've always learning something new we're always open to uh, listening to a word of advice to a mentor um you know just like i was telling cody before the the podcast i just listened to his uncle's podcast and right there this morning i learned something you know you you could you could always buy wisdom but you can't sell it well, you probably should shout out his podcast since it's been brought up. Do you know what it's called? No, <laughs> it, it's not. He was well, a he was a guest on a on yes. another. So he. Was, oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. he was. He was guest on. So maybe we can link to that or yeah. something. Yes, that would be great. It, it was definitely an inspiring story of how how God is using him and using his business to be able to be a blessing to somebody else, and that's very inspiring. This is something that I aspire to to be somebody that live with that example because I see the impact. We're, we're sitting in here telling our stories together of the five boys that one day, you know, did not have the means. But if you go and ask them, they will remember you playing on the floor with them. There was nothing wrong. You, you do everything that you can to shelter them from that kind of thing. But later on in life, you'll say, do you remember the time we're sitting on the floor playing? We really weren't counting quarters. I was just going to get groceries. <laughs> Yeah, till this day, CJ loves counting quarters and, and stack them up. You know, he's 13 years old. But it, it's that memory to them. If you look at their story from their point of view, it's a completely different perspective. Yeah, the day that my electricity was cut, you know, that night when it got dark early, you know, so you're inside <laughs> and it's a black, blacked out house. Dad, you where's you know, my we, TV? We, or we, we pulled the mattresses off the beds and it was camping. Wow. Right. So. You know, these are the things that you hope that they don't, you know, and, and, and of course, Jai, who is our oldest, he was a little bit more aware yeah. and that's how it's going to be. Yeah. But even with him, the con we had a little bit more of advanced conversation and yeah. say, Hey, look, this is what comes with risk. And, but you know what, here, there's reward that comes with risk. Yes. Yeah. So, right. But we'll stick together as a family and we'll get through it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, you just you just started to talk about uh, inspiration and and aspiration. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect segue into like what what do you what story do you want to write with the remaining uh, life that that whatever that ends up being that God gives you. Um, what what is where do you, what are you excited about from mm. here forward? We haven't talked about that, um, but maybe now this is a good time to talk about it. Uh, for the for the past twenty five years, I, I've I physically have lived in here in the U.S. now longer than I have lived in Lebanon. This is the first year. Wow. Um, and with that comes um, almost like self-awareness, if you want to call it, or uh, a heightened awareness to your legacy, to how well have I done in the last 25 years since I came in here. Um, you have the early years, the missed years. You have the uh, building block years, and now you have... Uh, a much better, easier, you know, process as far as how well do I run my business? How well do I run my life? Uh, how do I do managing friendships? How do I value those? How well do I value my relationship with my creator? How do I um, uh, value and, and appreciate the people that make the dream come through 
in business and in friendship and all different levels. So I look back in the past 25 years and I see a pretty wide um, path. Um, I look at my relationship with the people that I have done life with that God has allowed me to, to influence their life and they influence mine. And I want to take it one step further. I don't want to go just wide. I want to go deep. I want to be able to use my influence, whatever God has given me, to be able to empower um, individuals, whether they're business owners or friends, to be able to do the same thing that God has done for me and for them. And to be able to purposefully just take on somebody under their wing, uh, whether that's um, a younger person that's trying to figure out through life or a younger immigrant maybe that is just coming in to a new uh, country and a new place and be able to just show them. Whatever God has given you for talents and gift, be able to use it, but just do it on purpose that it's not just Sherbell's mentor or me or Sherbell's being mentored by somebody. I am being mentored by somebody that in my life that has had a huge influence in my life. And they have somebody that they're being mentored by. And so why can't we just pass that on, the, the value of mentorship, the value of coaching, the value of being a good model, a good example for someone that God has put you in their life for a reason, and how can I be the, that instrument? How can I be that blessing instrument for somebody? Because you never know. You never know where votary is going to go, how many people that you're going to touch through the stories that you're going to be telling, how many projects, how many films, how many uh short infomercials um what are you focusing on that nobody else is focusing on and how can that be used for the glory for the greater glory and be able to just leverage that and for me to be part of that to be just a stitch into that story i absolutely love it that that's like you said you know stories get you you know get you started with your day this is what gets me continue on getting me through uh, tough times after lawsuits and, and being in business and, and tough dealings and bad partnerships and bad marriages and bad things. This is what keeps me going is when you see that the difference that you're making through your life and for whatever little investment that you have done in somebody, then now they're going to be able to continue that a blessing and pay it forward. That's what really keeps me going. I think that this could be a good pause. We're over an hour now and there's so many things that I still wanted to get to with oh, you. Oh, wow. I think that, I think we're probably in line for a Charbel part two podcast at <laughs> yeah. some point soon. Cause I wanted to get into what you guys are doing now with Cedarwood and how you're kind of actually putting all of these things that you've learned into practice in the community in Worcester, uh, especially in the light of where we stand as state of the nation. There's just so many things to talk yeah. about that you have really unique perspectives on. Um, so maybe I, we'll have Christine. Yeah, them. I was thinking the same thing. We could bring another, we could bring Christina, we could bring another person that is in the same network that's, you know, coming alongside you in these Would things. Love that. Would love that. So I think that we'll, we'll tease that. <laughs> yeah. And, and if, since we're teasing, I think maybe we'll also tease that um, we have a, a secret project that we're partnering on as yes. well. And yep. it's, uh, it's, it's super, super special. It is very much in alignment with both of our stories coming together um, and what the way that we feel about this country. Let me ask you, um, as we close, just something that kind of struck me and was, I was interested in as, as you were talking. Can you think uh, over the last 25 years, half of your life that you've lived here, when did you feel like you were an American? Hmm. Wow, that's a great question. Um, honestly, the first couple of months I came in here, uh, the summer of 1995 and, uh, shortly after that, um, there was the 4th of July celebration. Uh, I remember, uh, going to, uh, the fireworks. I've never seen fireworks before. Um, and I remember standing on the sidewalk. Uh, hearing the, the bands playing and everything and just getting to that point where the fireworks are going to start. And I've seen fireworks on TV. I've never been there before. And um, when the fireworks started, we were very close to where the, um, where, the, where the fireworks had taken place. 
and I could feel um, the vibration of the explosion. That that was an eye-opening awakening for me because the last time I felt that mm. was the time where the bomb landed in front of our door. Uh, and for the first time that I am safe, that's a different friendly explosion versus the explosion that took half of my family away from me. Wow. Um, in that time, I feel like you're safe. Um, this is your country. You know, maybe I didn't have the, the green card yet. I didn't have the green card yet. But it was, you're okay. You're going to be okay. Just, just, this is a different kind of explosion. This <laughs> is a celebration versus uh, a funeral uh, recession. Um, and that was really the, the shift. I've expected to have a celebration, but I didn't expect to have an experience. And that's really the time where, you know, you're seeing everybody proud and everybody's waving the flags and wearing the silly hats and the celebration and the hot dogs and everything on the sidewalk. And that's everything that I picture in my head. Now I'm part of that story instead of just watching it on TV or watching it through a lens of somebody else's life. Um, that, that made an impact on me. With that, that's a great place to leave it. I just want to thank my good friend and our guest, our first guest ever in the mm -hmm. Rotary Podcast, Charbel Najem. Charbel, where can people find you? Um, find me on Facebook, on Twitter, Charbel uh, Najem. Um, if you want to see some of the companies, Cedarwood Realty Group and Capstone Builders, Inc. Um, would love to, to hear from you and hopefully my story inspire you and, and give you hope to just continue for one more day. And maybe you are on that journey, but you want to help somebody else. Would love to hear those stories as well. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.